Welcome, Josh Aronson. I'm so happy to have you here today on Ketamine Stories. Thank you and for having it, me. It's really a pleasure to have you. Um, you're a very well-known, just by way of introduction, you're a very well-known, well-regarded, famous filmmaker, Academy Award nominated, and a big, I'm a big fan of yours. And your most recent film really touched me very deeply, To Be of Service, which is quite a masterpiece, focusing on the journey of individuals, veterans, struggling with PTSD. And that was a very moving story because it really documents their journey through service dogs, with service dogs, to reconnect with their self back into a state of safety and love. So okay. let's start with that. Could you tell us a little bit about your work and where you are now with that project? Well, that project um, took three years. It was um, extraordinarily difficult for me because uh, I spent a year of filming a number of veterans who were, who were suffering from very severe PTSD. Um, PTSD has all ranges and it's a, a trauma that's very real. And these veterans coming back from war uh, have different kinds of um, uh, uh, experiences to say the least and uh, the ones we selected were ones who had gone through a lot of treatment uh, they've had treatment with um, uh, at the VA of therapy one-on-one -on -one talk therapy group therapy they had treatment with a lot of different kinds of meds and typically the VA over medicates dramatically and that's what we found very consistently it's really quite awful and um, most vets when they come back uh, and suffer from PTSD use self-medicate to try and suppress the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And the self-medication is drugs, and it's alcohol, and it's pretty ubiquitous among the vets who come back for the first couple of years. That's how they're living and that's how they survive. Uh, 22 a day commit suicide. So it's a real, real horrible situation. Uh, the vets that are able to get off of the uh, self-medication um, are qualified at that point for getting a service dog. And if they're lucky enough to find out about service dogs and they can qualify and they can get funded for it or if they can come up with the money for it because the dogs cost about $25,000, they go off and they work for two weeks with a trainer who trains them to work with the dogs. And then they bond in about 30 days. And the relationship changes them so dramatically that it's quite extraordinary to watch because the dogs help them leave their house, get out, and the dog has to go out and pee. So a vet who's been housebound for months on end, except for going out at three in the morning to shop, has to take his dog out to pee. So he gets outside of himself, and he feels the love of the dog. Ultimately, he'll fall in love with the dog, and uh, that brings him back to feeling. I mean, this is a very short version of it, but it brings him back to some feeling because one of the symptoms of great PTSD, of great trauma, is you freeze and you have emotion, no emotional feeling. And so the dogs love them, they love the dogs, and that's a, a doorway back to feeling people, their families. And um, uh, that said, uh, we followed uh, three vets for about a year uh, and watched their progress. And in each of the three cases, uh, they made dramatic improvements in their life. And um, uh, you know, we're, we're pushing very hard to try to get uh, um, uh, something called the PAUSE Act passed in Congress, which will mandate that the VA pay for these uh, service dogs, because uh, they don't pay for service dogs for uh, vets with PTSD at the moment. So that's the film. And uh, it was quite a, a difficult progress, uh, process for me because of the trauma, by, because I was with these traumatized men and women for so long, I would bring it home, and no doubt I got uh, secondary PTSD from it. Um, well, it's such a moving film. I have to say thank you for your description of it, because even listening to it again, I just feel it's so moving, the passion and the pain that you're describing. Please tell me, what was it like for you? I can't even imagine. How long were you filming and working in the trenches, so to speak? Well, I was, um, I was filming for about a year. Um, we uh, spent six months preparing the film, and by that I mean six months casting it and finding vets who are willing to be able to, to be filmed. And, uh, and then once we found them, we, we filmed one of them for a year and the others for some shorter duration of that. Um, one of the veterans lived in uh, Minnesota, and uh, we filmed her uh, in California and in Florida and in San Diego, and she was moving around a bit, so we did a lot of filming with her uh, and her husband. 
uh, one of our vets was in Billings, Montana, uh, and uh, was living in his home with his wife and child and never left his house. He was so frightened, he could never leave the house except to take his daughter to school at eight in the morning and then to pick her up at two. And the, the school was about uh, 200 yards from the house. And he said it took him a half an hour just to prepare to go out because he was so frightened of being vulnerable and being out in the open. Uh, uh, eight months later with his dog, he went and uh, he was fine and he was interacting with other parents and he was like a different man. It was quite an amazing experience with him. Really extraordinary, very extraordinary. So tell me, you know, I remember in another conversation you had told me that the, the demands on you were extraordinary. That what really helped you was your work with plant medicines. So I'd love to hear more about, about how your relationship to your own inner work was a resource for you during this time. Well, it's, it's interesting because um, I've been working with plant medicine for about six years, seven years. And I had the feeling midway through this film that had I not been working with plant medicines, had I not been working with really first-class facilitators, I could not have made this film. Um, because in the journeys, I was often taken to the, I called it the land of trauma. And it was as if I was experiencing what my veterans experienced. It gave me a perception of, the, of being them, mm -hmm. being them with PTSD. Um, I'm very fortunate in that I don't suffer from depression and I haven't had profound traumas in my life, although I've had some trauma. And uh, in, in filtering this film through my own experiences and my own trauma, I did have a sense that the story was universal in that everybody who has had trauma, everybody who suffers from PTSD in any level, has to find some modality of healing so that they can function in the world. And in the case of my vets, they weren't functioning at all. So between, between their therapy and their drugs and uh, the dog, it's a way for them to come back into the world. Um, for myself, it was therapy and it was working with people and it was a lot of work, a lot of self-work. But it was clearly that work that I did that helped me heal my own trauma so I could function at the highest level. And I think everyone with trauma has to find some pathway back. So that was the main story that could filter through me, which is, I think, what makes a film very personal. That's um, wonderful. But I'd like to get into that a little bit, um, a little bit more in detail, because I'd love to hear about your journey experiences, because clearly that's had such an impact on you, not only in terms of resilience to do this incredible um, work, but also to bring this subject even into the world for us all to respond and access our own trauma directly and indirectly. So... So it's amazing the creativity that has blossomed from your own inner work. You said you've been doing this for a while. How did you get involved in all of this? And um, could you say something about your own falling into your um, consciousness explorations? Yeah. Well, I, uh, looking back on it, as I say, I've been doing it for about seven years. Um, I think it's really tied to the, to the time when my mother died. Um, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 60s. And so it's a, you know, I always wish now because it was, it's been so impactful in my life to have done this work. I wish I'd started it earlier, but you start when you start. But I think when my mother died, it was a call to action to self-actualize, uh, to, self to find myself that was separate from the birth family that I had. Um, a facilitator said to me once, the work you're doing now is to deconstruct the scaffolding of your birth family. And that really struck me, that there was so much about the way I behaved, my, my reactivity, my, uh, my habitual uh, patterns of living, was so much uh, based on what my parents gave me, what I saw, what I witnessed. And it didn't feel true to me, and yet I was stuck in it. And so I think the seeking that I had, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the search that I had, was to find a way to get free of that so I could find myself. And I just had an instinct that was there. It started with, um, with meditation, actually. Uh, a, deep, a very good friend of mine introduced me to meditation about eight, nine years ago. And, uh, and it finally, it took a while, but it finally took. And, uh, and then he was the same person said to me, you know, there's more. And he told me about the work that was being done now across the country with plant medicines. I'm someone who had never done drugs in college. I mean, a little pot here and there, a little hash here and there, but uh, I'd done no psychedelics, probably because I had a very, very bad experience at a party once where someone had laced um, brownies with 
something that was very powerful and it was very a very bad trip. The one trip I had, and I and I ended up going to the emergency room hoping to get Thorazine because okay. I'd heard that Thorazine would bring you down from a bad trip. But because I went to school in New York, the hospital I went to, there were uh, uh, crash victims from, from oh which was in Harlem. So we were the kid, the college kids in the corner. My girlfriend and I were sitting in the corner, and we were waiting while all the blood victims, you know, were taken care of. And finally, we left. We just took ourselves home, and we just slept it off in two days. And uh, I don't think I had another psychedelic experience for 40 years after that. Oh, wow. It was so, so, so what was it like, your first experience? Can you tell us a little bit about... You know, uh, this is the interesting thing. I remember, now this is, I was 18 years old. I remember vividly sitting with a guy who finally did see us before we left. And he had, um, a, he was a very handsome, young, black uh, uh, sort of intern or receiving person at the hospital. And he was typing and he asked me, what was I feeling? And I remember vividly what I felt. And what I said was, it felt like my entire body was a thin skein, a tiny little thread, you know, or a tiny little skin covering an empty, vast, infinite universe. And I remember he was typing, he went, that sounds groovy. You know, and as, and as I hear it myself, and having journeyed as much as I have, I know that it probably was fantastic. And I was just scared out of my mind. I had no context. There was no set and setting. I was in a noisy party, given these drugs, and I was probably just scared to death. And uh, it's just such an example of what not to do the first time out. But uh, looking back on it, it was pretty fantastic. But I was so scared that I wanted out. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's indelible, the memory of what, I, what the experience was like. Uh, and, and interestingly, the closest of, and I've done quite a number of psychedelics, the closest experience I've had to that particular experience is ketamine. And because uh, ketamine is so dissociative that your body becomes separate from the experience you're having. And it's as if you put it on a slab. Someone made a reference to it recently that it's like, uh, like an avatar. You're the body and the experience you're having is out in the world. And uh, that's what it was like that I had this thin skein and in, in, inside of the skin was this vast infinite world. And that's what I often experience on ketamine. More and more, I do feel like um, this whole journey with medicines is they do allow you to ultimately get your place up. How much ecstasy can one house? Which sounds like you were right there, right in that moment. Um, but, so ketamine has, it's interesting that that really has been very powerful for you. Of all the plant medicines you've used, you, you mentioned that substance. <clears throat> what is your what was your first experience with ketamine like? Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about earlier today because I knew we were going to be talking about ketamine. That my first, ex I, I think I've done ketamine six times. Um, uh, the first four times uh, were lozenges, lozenges under the tongue, and twice I've done it I am. Uh, and the first time I remember vividly what it was like. Um, it was, it was a pure meditation. It was like meditation on the highest levels that I can only imagine not being a, a, you know, a, 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 a priest up in a cave in Bhutan for six months meditating. It's not, you know, I'm never going to be that guy. I'm never going to be that kind of meditator. But uh, the experience of what that is, I imagine to be similar to the experience I had uh, in my first journey. I felt as if I was going inside my mind and I had a, I had a, a passageway to be able to go and see the caverns that were infinite and infinitely beautiful. And they were like caves and light was coming around corners and there was a sound. I always hear a sound with ketamine. It's a sound, it's a drone sound with sort of a, a little, a little uh, subterranean cricket sound underneath it. And no matter what the playlist, I always hear that sound. And it's sort of the sound of the earth. It, it's the sound of enormity. It's the sound of scale. Uh, I've, just, I've come to that after doing it a number of times. That's why, and, and it's a welcoming sound because it's very satisfying. It's a very deep sound. So I had that sound for the first time, and um, I remember looking around corners and exploring caves, and finally having the feeling that my mind, because I knew I was in my mind, that it was infinite. It was empty, so I didn't know what that was about. There was nothing there. It was just infinite caverns of beauty that went on and on and on. There was not one person there. It was utterly empty, utterly safe. There was, there was always a feeling of safety in ketamine. And so 
uh, that was the biggest memory for my first uh, first one. That was uh, the rest of the memory of that was just speed. At, at one point, I shifted from that, and I felt I was the, on the point of a bullet going through time. And a lot of people report that kind of experience. And I would see the past, the present, and the future as I went by. And I was going both at the speed of light, and I was going slow enough so that everything was in slow motion as I went by. So I saw my past and I saw things happening that were happening in my life and everything was dissolving in sand, like, like slow motion sand as it dissolved. But I recognized the things and the places and in fact the people. So I, I take it back, there were people there, but I didn't interact with them. And it was just a velocity that was unbelievable to experience and it was fun. This is all I can say, it was just great fun. And the last experience I had, which was actually just about two, about a month ago, six weeks ago, I'd been I'd been um, reading about David Bohm, the physicist, and there's a film out of his called Infinite Potential. There's a documentary about him, which he's a quantum physicist, and he talks about the world and the interconnectedness of the world, uh, which of course goes with non-duality in my meditation practice. And he worked very very closely with Krishnamurti for many years, and I'd been absorbed with that sensibility and that reading and the film. And that's probably what sort of led me to this. But the ketamine, which was a, a good IM dose, very, very powerful dose, the biggest I'd ever had, it took me into the quantum universe, if that's the right word. It took me into the molecules and the neutrons and the quarks, the smallest pieces of the universe. And I saw everything in the tiniest terms, but it became an infinite field. So I could see everything clicking and moving in tiny little quarks that looked like Twinkies. It was a Twinkie shape. And it was a vertical wall and it was moving and clicking. And I had a sense I was looking at what made up the world. And then I would go inside one Twinkie and inside of that little tiny Twinkie that was just you know so small you couldn't see it of course, inside of that Twinkie, I'd be taken into another vast infinite world and over again and over again. So I kept on saying, it's inside the inside the inside. That's what it felt like. And then at one point, at one point, my entire body broke open. It like hinged open and golden light came out of my body. And I had the perspective from inside of my body. And I recognized that this infinite world was actually inside me. And so it was a real call to action to take care of myself. You know, there's a takeaway from it. Um, but it was, uh, it's, it, it was a journey to be integrated over a long period of time. And I'm still working on it. Ordinary, you have such, such a gift with language. You really allow us to enter into these inner experiences with you. Well, it's, it's, so, it's so difficult to explain these things. And explaining to people who have not done this work uh, probably makes it sound a little nuts. <laughs> but it is an extraordinary gift to have access to mind in this way. Uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's what we have. And it's, it's a birthright. And uh, I've, you know, of course, done all the reading and recognized that uh, that comes to us all the way from Huxley. And it is a birthright. This is what the shamans have been doing for such a long time. And uh, a facilitator at that particular session said to me when I asked him, what do we do with this information? What do we do with this experience? And he said something great. He said, it doesn't alter you. It expands you. And that's something I'm living with. I think that that's really good because you're saying your footprint in the universe is, is bigger because you have a sense of the depth of things and the tiniest depth of things. So it's quite an experience. And you've had quite a few experiences. Is there a moment or um, a few moments that come to mind when called to respond to what is the most memorable or your favorite um, ketamine experience that you've had? Or is there, is there a session that comes to mind or an experience within one? Well, you know, um, the two experiences I've just described to you, I think, are the most memorable, uh, which is why I mentioned them. I've had several ketamine experiences, which were just pleasant, you know, like anybody who's journeyed knows that sometimes you have transformative experience and sometimes you have no experience at all, depending on what you bring to the party and where you are and where your instrument, your body and your, your temperament is at that moment that you come in. Uh, into it. So I've had several that were just pleasant. Uh, you, it's, it's impossible. Those are the ones you spoke to. And you do describe a certain atmosphere and suddenly the, the sound. 
do you yeah. find yourself going to a landscape that is that is consistent in your journeys? No, no, not ketamine journeys or not any journeys. No, the landscape is very different each time. And that's why it's so exciting. You just never know where you're going. Um, I do often have this experience of speed that I described, that I'm just going through past, present, and future so quickly that uh, it's breathtaking. And, uh, but what I look at, what I see, the landscape where I am is often different. Uh, so, uh, but this, this last one, this, uh, this quantum one, quantum world, as I described it, uh, was different from anything I've done. And I've never been back inside my brain in the same way. Although I have had uh, several other experiences where I felt I was really experiencing uh, meditation at a very high level because there's a presence and there's no sense of thought. There's no, there's no monkey mind, as we say in meditation. There's no um, thoughts coming through, thoughts coming through, thoughts coming through. It's really much more of a, just a place and you can hold space for yourself. And it's very, it can be very uh, silent and quiet and um, eternal. There's an eternal kind of quality to it. But you know, there is, there is a quality that I experience all the time, and, and I love this actually, where when you're in this space that feels like a bubble, it feels like you're in this vast bubble, this ketamine bubble of experience uh, of the world in this perspective, uh, you, you realize if you think on another level that you are thinking and you are aware even though it's so consuming that there's no sense of overview, that you, you realize, but you are aware because all of a sudden you'll hear a car go by or all of a sudden you'll hear a noise or someone else with, with you saying something or crying or whatever it is. And then I, I get curious and then I'll pick up my hand and I'll just peek out of my, my mask just to make sure I'm in the place where I know I am and I see that I'm there. And then here's what I wonder, who's thinking that? Where is the consciousness outside of the bubble that I'm experiencing? Where is the consciousness coming from to ask that question? And that's the meditation question, subject, object, which is who's the seer, who's the looker? If the breath is the object, and that's what I'm concentrating on, if you turn around your concentration and look, who's watching the breath? And that's the experience I have often in ketamine. And it's wonderful. And I go looking for the consciousness, and I've, of course, never found it. But I do feel that it's not in my body. And even more than meditation, I feel that the consciousness that I am, that I have, is outside of myself. That it's connected to something more eternal and bigger, which is sort of an invitation to think about soul, to think about other lives, to think about all the things that uh, we all noodle around with. and. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Thank you. That's such a beautiful description. Very profound. Some of the ideas you share with us today. How do you feel ketamine um, compares with some of the other plant medicines you've, or plant medicines and experiences you've had? It sounds like you've had quite a range of different experiences and experiments with different medicines. Where would you say it distinguishes itself or its place in the whole landscape of, of psychedelic medicine? Well, I think several um, psychedelic, uh, several different psychedelic, psychedelic um, medicines have a similarity to them uh, that I've experienced. Um, 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 mushrooms, uh, psilocybin, of course, uh, and we used to get uh, from a facilitator a combination of psilocybin and ayahuasca in a chocolate. We called it ma, and that would take me to a place that was always often similar to just psilocybin. Uh, there's uh, one of the facilitators I have that's experimented with a, a lot of different um, uh, medicines and uh, they're similar to the experience of psilocybin. I won't go through what they are and everybody could find out. Um, they're similar, but ketamine is different from all of them. I mean, that is really distinct. Um, although I did salvia once uh, and salvia is a very unique experience that's mind bending and bends the dimensionality of the universe. Uh, it's quite interesting. Um, it overlapped a little bit into this recent ketamine experience as I described my body hinging open and allowing light to explode out of me. It really was like a three dimensional experience of my body opening like that. And salvia, you have the entire universe, the three-dimensional universe does that. 
looks like the, the, the lines of dimensionality are changing. And uh, it's a very bizarre and remarkable experience. It's not a psychedelic in that it takes you inward. It's not a psychedelic in that it takes you to other places or planets or the cosmos. It's simply the experience of the world in geometry in a totally different way. It's unique. Um, so I've had that. I've not done um, 5-MeO and I've not done um, other things. Uh, Acid, of course, is a completely different experience for different people. Um, I've done it a few times, uh, never uh, back in the day. I did it uh, only, as I said, in my 60s. And each time it was joyous, uh, each time it was fun. And the, the telling thing for me about uh, acid is it takes me back to childhood play. Mm -hmm. So the first time I did it, I really had the sense that I was five years old, having so much fun and experiencing it with people, and then just experience the beauty of colors and the things that I was seeing. But I really had a sense in that inner voice, I haven't felt this way since I was five years old. And it was just joyous. And yes. I have had that each time I had yeah. yeah. Well, you're certainly um, an explorer of these medicines and you speak so powerfully and so descriptively about them. How have they impacted your life? How would you say um, this, it's changed you or has it changed you? Well, that's the, of course, that's the question for all of us, you know, because at this stage of the game, I'm not doing this for entertainment, although they certainly are and they can be entertaining, but equally so they can be very dark and they can take you to very dark places. Uh, those trauma experiences I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, those places, uh, those experiences of going to trauma, the land of trauma, because I was so immersed with veterans with PTSD who were traumatized, it was very dark and it was very hard. But what it gave me in that instance is it gave me the perspective of the men and women I was with so that I could be more compassionate, I could be more understanding, I could ask better questions when I interviewed them. And they let me in. I earned their trust enough so that I could be one of the, you know, in the club, if you will. I could be part of it. And uh, they were very generous in, in calling me brother because among these people, when they, when they call you brother, they recognize who you are. And, uh, uh, and I was accepted. So certainly the plant medicine let me see where they lived and experience it and enabled me to be completely understanding of it. Uh, beyond that, oh gosh, I've had so many powerful and important experiences uh, that were changing to me and impactful to me in many ways. Um, I've done ayahuasca only a few times, but um, ayahuasca was very difficult for me. Uh, and it, but it showed me a core wound, as was explained to me by a, a facilitator. And uh, she worked with me, and we realized what the core wound was. I realized what it was. And uh, she offered me the opportunity to go to work. And she said, you know, you cannot do ayahuasca again. You cannot go near this pain that you experienced. And you can continue to live a very high-functioning life, and you'll do just fine. Or we can go to work on it. We can find out what it is and you can live an undefended life if you come to terms with it. And the language, an undefended life, was so seductive and so real, and I understood it after the years I've been working with. That's the seeker in me. That's what I want. I want to live an undefended life so I can experience every moment and be present for it and, and, uh, and live with bliss and joy. And um, so I did. And what we did after she prescribed to me um, three months of somatic therapy first to go to work on it, I, I went to see this woman uh, at her home where she works, and uh, I had a very profound uh, psilocybin experience. And in that experience, she talked to me one-on-one -on -one as a therapist would, and she talked me through it, and we did um, um, uh, dr drama games where she brought the characters into the, the session, the characters that were relevant to the, uh, the trauma that I was trying to unwind. And in the work we did in four hours, I unwound it. And I was able to forgive people that I thought were unforgivable. I was able to reconnect and to understand who they were. In this case, it was my mother. And I understood who she was and why she was the way she was. And I could forgive her and I could love her and recognize that she loved me, although she couldn't show it so often. That was from mushrooms and very profound facilitation by a, a brilliant facilitator. Uh, I really appreciate how much you emphasize the value of these um, psychedelic substances, as well as the value of competent and um, well-trained well facilitators. 
yeah. your stories are definitely suggesting both of those things. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, if someone met you before and knew you before from prior to your falling down the rabbit hole of psychedelic exploration and consciousness expansion and met you now, what do you think would be the features they would identify that are most um, notable or would they notice anything? And if so, what would that be? They would say has shifted or who would they observe? Well, certainly they would notice a difference. And I can say that for, for, with assurance because it's happened to me multiple times. So people that I've seen, I see only occasionally in my life would see me, uh, you know, saw me over the years after I started doing psychedelics and they commented, what's happened to you? And I would get language like that. And, it wasn't uh, subtle. It was, it was so clear and there was such a clear difference in the way uh, I had become. So there was no doubt about that. Uh, I never really got language from them about the difference, but I certainly have a feeling of what the difference is. And I think basically it's what that facilitator said to me in that private. I think I've been able to come to a place where I can live by and large an undefended life. So I don't, I'm not risky. I can live without the defenses. I can recognize those issues with myself and I can be more vulnerable. I think it's really vulnerability. And uh, I think that vulnerability gives you access to feeling that you can share your own feelings and take in others. And people feel that in you. And that changes relationships and it changes your relationship with yourself profoundly. And I think that's by and large my, the difference in me over the years. Well, you've certainly displayed that today, Josh. Thank you so much for joining us and being so vulnerable and open with us okay. and telling us your ketamine stories. Great pleasure to be with you, Gita, because I love you. Thank you. Thank you.